really needed to try to understand what it meant to live inside capitalism. And I was, the impulse behind that was because I was feeling how much my life now was reminding me of how it felt to live as a white person within segregation. I grew up in Alabama, where one narrative was put forward as the truth, and I was told it would never, ever change because it was natural, God's law, et cetera, et cetera. Turning the switch off. Habit. The key in the ignition, and no, maybe never thought about why, what happens next. Turn down Gertrude into Amon, sun into shadow, under the overpass, then the sun gnawing at my ear at the red light. The comfort of habit, not psychological. The pileated cackle every June in the old magnolia, rejoicing the chambered seed cone has opened the plump lip. What habit gives us and when it fails. To Shabi says there were two seasons, wet and dry. The farmers knew time out of time when to plant until now. The drought, the weather has changed its habit, or something else has changed the mind of the climate. We were watching Norma Ray yesterday holding hands. The mill hands reached out and turned each switch off. How hard to break the habit of work. Obedience not to machines, but to those who own them. The hand reaching out to take its own, bringing the fragment, the red seed, delicious to the mouth. Poetry as a way of thinking and seeing through possibilities for the next thing. And I was also experiencing writing this poem as part of the dialectical interchange between my experience, my thinking, and actually those things in separation. I see them as interchanging with each other. And that means that this poem is in conversation with many other people and many other moments. Um, so I want to talk about um, four uh, of those people that the poem is also in conversation with because it gives you a context for the poem uh, that the poem I feel is in deep conversation with is Milton Eidenberg. He's a friend, a mentor, a comrade. He was a union organizer. He's in his 90s now. I talk to him all the time. And he was teaching me Marxist economics. <laughs> and um, he told me, he said to me during this long conversation about his life as a steel worker, he talked about a wildcat strike uh, to support a labor organizer in the steel mills of, of, um, of Buffalo, New York. And he, he talked about how hard it was for people to turn off their machines. Mm -hmm. And when you go to work every day, and you, and those of you, us who use a computer, you know that. What do you do? The first thing I do when I get up, I turn on my computer. <laughs> right? So he, he was talking about how what it meant to be a worker, you turn your machine on and then then everything that comes from it, right? And how hard it is to turn the machine on. And habit, the habit of work, right? So all of that, um, I felt like, came in, in into the, the poem. Um, and the fact that poetry, that, that complexity of that moment of turning on the machine, turning off the machine, that multiple edginess of that moment, and how that is also the way poetry is as a tool. Lee and I had this conversation the other day. And the way metaphor is, you know, we say the rose is like, or, you know, this, is, this action was like a knife, or, well, knives can kill you, and knives can set you free of your bonds, mm -hmm. right? And poet, poetry is the same. It's mm -hmm. not, it's, a tool has no a fixed value, meaning. Right, it depends on what you do with it. it. Also, in this poem is my own experience working on the line in a garment plant in Alabama, a, a 
when I was 15, when I was 16, it was my first job. It was extremely unusual at that point in time. That was 1963, because the plant had black and white workers working together. I've never been able to find out how that came to be. It was a runaway plant from New York City. And I believe that the owners must have made some kind of deal that that would be the case. Very complicated why they would do it that way, right? It's not just a benevolent act. Um, so my thinking about that job and what that meant, and also the fact that I assume those workers were not only not organized by a union, but had, there had been no union activity in my hometown of about 800 to 1,000 people in Central Alabama ever, until some years later when I went to the senior center with my mother and started talking to the ladies at the senior center, oh, who, many of whom had worked at the garment plant as well, and found out that the ILGWU had successfully organized one of the plants in the town. That I and I had never heard the official uh, coercion because the story is not out there about what has actually happened in our own histories, in our own lives. This sort of a, my school system, a segregated school system, wasn't going to teach me anything about organizing anything. Right? Um, a different education was being had by the black students in their schools. In some ways, they were. They were being punished by the lack of access. In other ways, they were getting to hear the history. I was in conversation with this Audrey Lord, a great poet of lesbian and feminist um, of African descent. Um, and her essay, The Uses of the Erotic, in which her, the line that is most significant to me in that is, we have been taught to fear the yes within us. We have been taught to fear the yes within us. And she puts that fear in the context of an economic system, of capitalism, that needs us, thank you, to be afraid of what we want. And I remember being in my house in, that I grew up in, where my mother still lived, in the, probably would have been in July. The magnolia seeds were ripe. And, uh, and you could hear the palliated cackling as it was eating um, the, the seeds. And my mother said to me, he comes back every year. He comes back every year. And that just went right through me, you know. The fact that the tree was still there and the bird was still there and my mother was still there, and yet knowing how fragile that is now, My mother has since died, um, cast, died captive to her habits of thought still. Mm -hmm. Captive to the segregationist views she was taught, captive to her anti-Semitism, captive to her, her homophobia and her fear of me as a lesbian. And mm -hmm. so to, to me, this poem um, is about embodying the complexity and beauty of being in struggle. I don't see those things as being in opposition. Beauty here, resistance here. I see them as being the beauty of struggle, the beauty and the savoring the delight of it. The fact that every poem exists in the matrix, of not only the poet's context, but the context of you who are listening and reading and the interchange that we have with each other around our experience, our thought, our action. Um, and that the, all of that exists in each historical moment, the specificity of that historical moment, like right now, Trayvon Martin, the demonstrations, the messages on, the, on social media, the, you know, the struggle that we're in with the mainstream media on, is a tool in my thinking to know where I am in each crucial moment where my decision to act or not to act has, is part of what will define a future that is coming.